Hey, how's it going? It's been fun these past 6 weeks or so seeing how various of all Pokemon can just dominate the game, but it's time to get back to some more challenging runs. Having fun is over, it's not allowed anymore. So when I did the Growlithe run a while back, I do like I normally do, I posted on my imager page. This prompted a particularly ignorant and hateful commenter to say some, honestly some pretty wrong things. It started out with them not understanding the concept of solo runs, and when it was explained that you have to actually change your starter, I was then called a cheater, and then when I explained that that how going through the entire game with a slow leveling group P of all Pokemon only is actually much harder than the base game. Uh, I was told that it's actually not a solo run because you use other Pokemon for HMs. So you see how this is going to go. Whatever point I make, the goalposts are going to be moved and there's going to be another reason I'm wrong. It's just your classic internet asshole not only being extremely pedantic but also extremely wrong and we'll see coming up. Now I like to preface this by saying I'm usually, I'm very, I'm a very positive person. I like to keep a positive disposition on life. There's usually no room for negativity or negative energy. So I do the responsible thing here. And I pretty much say, you know, it's clear you don't like what I'm doing. So why continue to comment on it? Let's just go our separate ways. So this is where it devolves a little bit. I get hit with the old making fun of a noob do a noob thing straight out of the seventh grade insult handbook. I was honestly shocked I didn't see them say that, you know, I was mad, are you mad bro? Stuff like that, classic kid stuff. And you might be saying, Matt, what's the point of this? Uh, where's this going? And let's get to that. So from that point, I was told if I wanted to actually do a challenging run, I should do Charmander. So when I responded that Charmander would be very superior to Growlithe for this or that reason, the person then said that they are on the same level, which honestly, if you think about it, it already contradicts what they previously said, because if they are in the same tiers, why would it be a challenge to do one over the other? And I suggest trying not to think about it too hard, because if you stoop down to Doink Turkey's Dunn's level of thinking, you might die from a stupid overload. And he ends the comment, this whole string here, by saying that I should study more. Well guys, today, you can see that this video is going to be a little bit biased. I'm not one to be petty, but one of my biggest pet peeves in life is when someone doesn't know what they are talking about, but they keep speaking in a way that suggests that they do. So not only am I going to study more, I'm going to present an entire video essay that will show every area of the game that Charmander excels at over Growlithe, and by the time this video is over, it'll become crystal clear that Doink Turkey's done doesn't know shit about Pokemon and should sit at the kids table with little Timmy and let the big boys uh, and girls because 8.3% of you are women that watch my channel and I love and appreciate you just the same but let the big boys talk about Pokemon you know what I'm saying so grab yourself a soda pop get yourself a notebook get you a nice number two pencil get in your best studious mindset because today we're gonna really study up on Charmander and we're gonna learn what it's like to say something stupid on the internet and then be proven wrong within the next minute but before we begin I'd really Really quickly like to say that if you enjoy my content feel free to subscribe and hit that bell to stay updated on my videos remember that likes even dislikes any sort of comments even if you're the doink turkeys duns of the world and you have something negative to say and you have dislikes it still helps out the video I still appreciate you it still breaks me out of that small channel YouTube algorithm the it doesn't differentiate between hateful comments and dislikes so keep them coming if you're stupid and you want to say something dumb just say it I appreciate you just the same but here part of those people I usually interact with, that small close-knit group of people, I appreciate you really helping my channel grow. And now that's out of the way, let's calm down and let's just show how much better Charmander actually is over Growlithe. This is going to be fun. This run feels pretty great. Charmander is a default starter and no changes are necessary for once in our runs. As per usual, I do reset for some decent DVs so I can get a good representation of Charmander's capabilities and off we go. I do not do minimum battles and I take on the Bug Catchers in Viridian and right from the start there are going to be two gargantuan advantages that Charmander has over Growlithe. It literally took, what, 15 seconds into the gameplay footage for me to get to these? The first is that Charmander does not suffer from the slow leveling group, meaning that it won't take a year to gain levels and we can just naturally accrue them without going out of our way too much. The second and most important thing is that it learns Ember at level 9. Growlithe learned Ember at level 18 and it was forced to do Brock without it after wasting over an hour of in-game time. 
So with Ember in hand, I go to Brock at level 10. I fail several times, and that's almost exclusively due to the fact that Onyx outsped me at this point, and I had no control over when it used Bide. I didn't know if it was going to use it or not. So this means that it was just a guessing game, and if it used Bide, I used Ember, then I was just going to take some significant damage, and it was going to make the fight nearly impossible. So to remedy this, I battle the junior trainer before Brock, their Pokemon do a lot of damage and it's a pretty close fight, but it's pretty pivotal as this gets me up to level 12, which will allow me to outspeed Onyx and control the fight without having to just blindly throw moves into a bite. I return to Brock, I fail once again, but on the second attempt I do get past it. There's surprisingly a little bit of strategy in this early game, and I appreciate that about some of these pre-evolved runs. First up is Geodude, and you'll need to do at least a few growls to get the tackle damage down to a fairly low amount. I messed around with a certain amount, but you need at least three here. Ember is resisted, but Geodude's special is low enough that it actually does some pretty decent damage. Now onto the Onyx, outspeeding it is a must. Ember does pretty decent damage, just like with Geodude. Uh, when it uses Bide, you growl it, that'll make the tackles do less, and more importantly, it will nullify Bide entirely, as we've seen in our previous runs. It's a slow and steady approach to the fight, but it's what you need, and Ember just gives you more than enough damage to get past this fight fairly easy. Even after healing, buying from the Pokemart, and walking up to the next route, I save at 20 minutes of in-game time. Now let me strongly emphasize that this is already 1 hour and 16 minutes faster than when Growlithe saved after Brock, and there's still a couple of more reasons why Charmander is better than Growlithe. I'm not trying to rub it in, but I bet you would feel really unknowledgeable and honestly just kind of stupid if you were arguing with me on Imager about this at some point. And we're just getting started, guys. We're just getting started. I digress, though. The only thing to say before Cerulean is that Ember is a pretty terrible move, but having it so early makes these trainers around here very lucrative sources of extra experience since it's super effective against a lot of them. And throughout this run, I'll be doing a lot of optional battles in preparation for the one single Pokemon that I'm already having nightmares about, and that's going to be Lance's Gyarados. But let's not think about it too much. Let's knock it out of our head. There are more pressing matters in the near future. The only thing of note through this little section of the game is that I pick up Mega Punch to give Charmander some extra kick during the next couple of segments in the game. It's a definite upgrade from scratch, even with its 85% accuracy. It goes without saying that this is also an upgrade from Galath, since dogs can't punch, obviously. Onwards to Cerulean, I'm a long way from being able to face Misty, so our only choice here is rival number two. This fight is pretty annoying. I lose a couple of times due to sand attack accuracy drops or just being chipped down to the point where Squirtle's bubbles can just take me out, but on the third time I do make it past. Mega Punch isn't that reliable and luckily we won't have it much longer, but that 85% accuracy is just compounded when you start taking sand attacks. I do hit a string of luck on the third attempt and despite being really low, Squirtle just goes for tackle for no reason at all and I miraculously don't miss any Mega Punches and that gets us through with without too much time spent on this fight. After that, I do battle extra trainers on the way to Bill's house, but it's nothing special. After getting Dig, I figured there's no harm in attempting Misty now just to see if we can get a really nice final time, but it's actually going to be pretty futile as you'll see. I tried this fight at least 10 times to see if there's any way I can just miraculously RNG my way to a victory outside of the obvious problem that Starmie and Bubble Beam will just absolutely obliterate me. I can't come close to consistently one-shotting the Staryu and that's a big problem. Ideally, you would also want the Dig to two-shot the Starmie, but it's not close either. When Misty uses an X defend, it gets even worse and this just isn't happening right now. I bang my head on this wall more than I probably should have, but eventually I accept the reality that pre-evolved fire types will probably have to skip this fight since Starmie is just pretty grossly overpowered this early in the game. So from there, I scoot on down to Vermilion and I head to the SSN. I do pick up Body Slam, but before I actually learn it, I battle a bunch of extra trainers and exhaust all my PP of Mega Punch for some much needed experience for Misty. The extra gentleman trainers on board are especially good because of that sweet extra cash they give for winning. Eventually I make my way to rival number 3 at level 29 and surprisingly I'd lose my first attempt. I didn't expect that. I get hit with a double sand attack, I miss a few hits and I get chipped down low enough to where the Kandabra can just finish me off. The second attempt goes infinitely better. By the grace of Arceus, Pidgeotto only goes for quick attacks and this gives me a much easier time on the subsequent Pokemon. 
The key thing to note here is that Charmander learns Slash. I learned it during the middle of this fight. I've talked about Slash several times in my videos. It's an 8 times crit multiplier move, and although Charmander isn't a stat monster, this move is still extremely serviceable until very late in the game. Near guaranteed crits can really carry a run for a really long time. Anyways, the War Turtle does get a super effective move, but we tank it quite nice, and Slash finishes off this battle. Afterwards, I get cut, and since we can't use it without Missy's badge, we can't fight Lieutenant Surge, so there's no more putting it off. It's time to go face off with Starmie once again. And what a difference five levels makes. You'll have to take my word on it that Staryu is now a consistent one shot, but I just critically hit it anyway and get it out of the way. On to the Starmie. A dig can two shot it now, but that's not the amazing part of this fight. First, it surprises me that I actually outspeed the Starmie, and I get the first dig off and I do half health damage, and the next surprise is that Charmander can actually tank a bubble beam quite well. Misty then uses an X defend, and that means that the second dig does not take it out. What really surprised me here is that Charmander is able to survive a second water gun despite being only 34 HP. A slash finishes off this battle in one shot, and from this point, Charmander starts to extend its lead over Growlithe as the best pre-evolved fire type. The rock tunnel portion of the game is simple, but I do get a little overconfident on the hiker. I go into the fight missing a decent chunk of health because I have Dig and I think I'm untouchable at this point. I get chipped down, Dig can't one hit the Pokemon, and a rock throw from the Graveler almost faints me, getting me down to a mere 7 HP. I do survive, but it was just a close brush with death. Moving on to Celadon, I pick up Fly, I immediately head to the gym, I fight all of the trainers in the gym since Ember makes all of them pretty much an easy source of free levels to prepare for the later parts of the game. When it comes to the Erica fight, it's a lot tougher than I initially anticipated. Holding off into this fight until Flamethrower would have made it much safer, but I just wanted to do it now. It's my money and I want it now. Any JG Wetworth fans in the chat? The first couple of attempts go roughly the same. Poison status combined with wrap, bind, constrict, or whatever broken multi-turn moves that prevent me from taking my own turns while poison slowly sucks the life out of me means that I just got chipped down and I can't do a whole lot. This coupled with the fact that I'm out of potions and I'm attempting this fight while missing 31 of my 89 HP from the start makes it way tougher than it actually needed to be. Eventually on the third attempt, I do make it past the victory bell, only getting poison and not taking any extra damage, and that allows me to weave my way through the fight and get this badge over with. I'd have to say that this fight was fairly easy just due to the fact that I started missing so much health and the fact that Ember wasn't even really needed here. Now we're moving on to the Rocket Hideout and as always that means this is our first run in with Giovanni and as you might have been able to predict, Dig is a huge help for this fight. It doesn't quite one hit the Onyx but it's really close. The Rhyhorn does get one shot from it though. I do level up, I get access to Flamethrower and I put it to use on the Kangaskhan who thinks that this is still the ROM hack version and almost kills me with a crit. I'd also like to quickly say that having access to flamethrower around the time of Erica is also a huge advantage Charmander has over Growlithe. Remember in that run, I didn't even have to use it because by the time I was the level to get it, I was in Victory Road and I'd already used Fire Blast on it. Anyways, this is an easy fight. Flamethrower strong. That's the gist of what I'm saying. Now it's time for some slight backtracking. I make my way through the Saffron Guards. I head down to Vermilion to pick up Surge so that I can use Fly outside of battle. This fight isn't a challenge, but I find it funny that I have access to super effective dig but Slash is such a solid move that I just use that three times and I end the fight really quickly. Remember, I only skipped this one due to not being able to do Misty at the time and it's worth noting that it would have been a cakewalk even if I could have immediately fought Surge. Now with Fly in hand, it's time for Pokemon Tower and that means rival number four. And I'll be honest with you, this is just a showcase of how good Slash is against easy opponents. The only thing of note in this battle is that Execute can go to hell, it puts me to sleep, it tickles me with some pathetic barrage damage while it wastes a lot of my time, and just prolongs the inevitable. There will be some hard battles to come in this run, but this this isn't it. I finish up the tower, I get the Pokey Flute, beat up a Snorlax, head down to Fuchsia City. And this leads us to Koga, and it's not a difficult fight, but I do fail some. The big reason is that I go into this fight poisoned. The first time Muck decides to be an asshole, it uses Minimize, I miss the follow-up dig, I get chipped down some more, then I get hit with some sludge, battle over. After that I adjust, I actually use the items to cure my poison, 
and the fight is much easier to no one's surprise. I even get what is one of my favorite things in Pokemon Red and Blue, which is what I like to call the Koga Special. It's where you dig on the Weezing and it uses self-destruct when you're immune to damage, and it always feels good and always makes this fight go much faster. And with this victory, that takes us to five badges and we are inching ever so closer to completing the run. Afterwards, I pick up my last two HMs inside the Safari Zone, and then it's time for some Sylph Company shenanigans. And this section takes a while, and that's mainly because I know the demons at the end of this run, and we need those sweet and precious levels. So I battle every single trainer inside of the building, from floor 2 all the way up to floor 11. This gets us a lot of experience, and outside of that, there's also one more important thing to note, and that is the last reason that Charmander is leaps and bounds ahead of Growlithe, and that is due to the fact that Charmander learns Swords Dance. I don't need to sing the praises of this move too much, but it's got a physical move set, and this is an attack and speed boosting move, which also triggers the badge boost. It's really good. I don't learn it immediately because Slash still has a lot of mileage left before we actually have to use Swords Dance. And this takes us to rival number 5, and with all the extra battles, I'm entering this fight at a nice and beefy level 51, and that allows us to easily get through this fight on the first attempt. Everything falls fairly easy, Slash and Body Slam provide consistent and solid damage, Dig provides coverage and is super effective against Growlithe, Flamethrower is a powerful stab move and that just murders Execute. The only potential threat is Blastoise, but with our level combined with bad move selection like Bubble, means that we can outlast this damage easily. And we all know rival number 5 is generally a tough test in these games, but getting past it on the first time bodes well for our little fire salamander. After that is Giovanni number 2, and honestly this fight is always anticlimactic after the rival fight, and this is no exception. It's like how the first Giovanni fight went, but even easier. Dig is really all you need, and the Pokemon that do manage to survive go down with a follow up slash or a body slam. I barely take any damage, and at this point, the end of the regular season is in sight, and it's time to make sure we are ready for that in game. I go ahead and head to the Saffron Gym to face Sabrina with our current level and physical moveset. This fight is over very fast. I can slice down the first two Pokemon, then I utilize Flamethrower to char the Venomoth. And then I go with Dig to ensure that I get a powerful physical move against the frail Alakazam. And that's just a one shot victory, six badges down. Now after a brisk early morning swim down to Cinnabar, it's time for some Tombstoner brother. I do battle every trainer in this gym as well. We still need lots of levels despite how relaxed the run has gotten. And from there, there's not much to say about Blaine. I don't even need the super effective dig against the first two pre-evolved Pokemon. Ponyta and Growlithe can be dealt with by Body Slam with no issues. I don't take any chances on the last two Pokemon, and Rapidash goes down to a single dig. Arcanine is a beefy boy as always, and can tank a dig, but it goes down to the next one. Perhaps I could have saved a turn by using Slash, but I didn't want to risk it. Overall, it's another easy gym, and in this fire type solo run, I didn't make the mistake of skipping trainers like I did with Growlithe. This leads us to the last gym, and ultimately the end of the regular season. Once again, we need some more levels to prepare for the end game, so I battle all of the optional trainers inside of Giovanni's gym, and this leads us to the gym battle at level 56, which is more than sufficient to breeze past this fight. The only thing even maybe worth mentioning is that I'm not powerful enough to one hit the last three Pokemon, and they take an additional move to go down, but other than that, I hardly take any damage, and we go into the final six fights of the game with a pretty good bit of momentum. But how much momentum? First up, we have a solid test with rival number six, and let's see how that one goes, shall we? The first attempt is looking great. Pidgeot, it can take a couple of moves, but it's not a problem. Rhyhorn, Growlithe, and even Execute are a non-issue and very easy to handle. And it's looking great, up until I make it to the Alakazam. I'm having some Vietnam flashbacks about this speedy little spoon-wielding cat. And it gets lucky enough to confuse me from a side beam. I hurt myself, it sets up Reflect, and I linger on this spot a little bit too long, and I just take a little bit too much damage, and when I make it to the Blastoise, I try to go for Slash to see how much damage it'll do, and then I get hit in the face with a Hydro Pump. It finishes me off with ease, and here's the next attempt. In this attempt, it, it's got me rolling my eyes all the way in the back of my head, and it's more or less the same situation as the first fight. This time, a turn 1 reflect makes my damage pathetic against the Alakazam, and then it decides that it's bored and it wants to end this fight with a single 100-0 to zero critical hit psychic, and that's very cool. 
The third attempt. Seems like it's all done. Poor AI move selection gets me past the Alakazam without taking much damage. And I have the battle all but done. The Blastoise is going for nothing but withdrawals. It's, it's a done deal. I don't go for Dig or even for Flamethrower since its defense was boosted up a lot. And eventually, it, I just let it hang on too long and it just Hydro Punks me and kills me. And it's always frustrating to see these self-inflicted mistakes like this. I could have won this one. And finally, the fourth attempt, we get it done. The Nightmare is over. I do make an absolute blunder on the execute. I'm on autopilot at this point, and I click dig rather than the guaranteed one-shot flamethrower on accident, and that almost comes back to bite me. It gets off a stun spore, and I have to finish off the entire battle with half speed and the chance of just having our turn skipped. It's not the ideal situation. It's worth noting that I do believe Slash would have made Alakazam the joke. I do believe that the buff that Reflect gives you that has physical damage would just be completely ignored by the slash critical hits but by the time I make it to Blastoise, I just go for straight body slams. I get the paralysis proc, and I'm lucky enough for it to miss its one hydro pump. No shenanigans go on. Eventually, I use a flamethrower. I finish off the fight. And while it may seem like this fight was kind of difficult, keep in mind that I still have access to Swords Dance, and that would have made this fight much easier, so why didn't I use it? Well, friends, I think Slash is great, and I'm still going to fight some trainers inside of Victory Road. If it would have seemed impossible to make it past that fight, kind of like how it was with Growlithe, of course I would just went ahead and learned it, but four attempts isn't that bad, so please stop judging me. And as I make my way towards Indigo Plateau, I battle some key trainers, not all of them, uh, particularly lucrative ones like this trainer that has the Parasect that's times four weak to fire, and a Chansey that just gives you a ton of experience, and those are the ones you need to look out for if you're just, if you're not skipping everything, but you just want to battle some, this is a great trainer to battle. Before we begin in the Elite Four, I do make a quick trip back to Celadon to buy some vitamins, and this is a complete waste of time. I leave this piece in because it's worth noting for future runs that if you ever do a lot of extra battles like I did, your stat experience, or EVs, whatever you want to call them, gained from feigning enemy Pokemon will more than likely be all the way maxed out, and that turns out to be the case with Charmander. Everything is maxed, and nothing will have any effect. I made this same mistake in the EV run, so I'm going to keep this in here for a reminder for future runs. For me. And this leads us to the final stretch. The first order of business is to learn Swords Dance by replacing Slash. You've served us well, old friend, but this is the point in the run where your usefulness has run out. I'm level 60 at this point, and that's a fine starting point, but I know we'll need more. I use 8 of my 11 rare candies and I get up to level 68. As always, I save 3 rare candies for the last 3 fights so that I can level up on my own terms and reset my experience so that I don't level up at a bad time and reset my Swords Dance badge boost in those pivotal final fights. Now it's time for Lorelei and let's just see how it goes. This fight starts off very annoying. I go for a Swords Dance to boost me up a little bit and Dugong decides that this is a no fun zone and it goes for multiple growls which essentially forces me to utilize flamethrower for this fight. It's not really as bad as it sounds. I get past the dugong and then cloister comes in. With the boost flamethrower can actually take it down in a single hit so that's a relief. Clamp would really hurt in this situation. Next up is Slowbro and it's tanky but it's surprising just how much damage a resisted flamethrower actually does to it. It doesn't go for any damaging moves and it hangs around for a few turns but eventually a body slam finishes it off. Jinx is next, and Flamethrower is the answer to this abomination of a Pokemon. One hit is all that it takes. Last up is Lapras, and Hydro Pump would be a problem, but we could tank one if we had to. We are at full health. A Flamethrower does neutral damage and gets it to about half health, and it gets its one shot at a Hydro Pump, but it misses. A follow-up Flamethrower checks it out, and that's Lorelai's first attempt. We didn't even take a single point of damage out of all the attempts I did on the Elite Four. Lorelai gave me minimal trouble outside of maybe some awful luck, and we're moving on to Bruno. And today, I'm going to take it easy on this shirtless Neanderthal this time and give some actual analysis. Dig is the answer to this second grade level questions that this fight asks. At first, I don't even bother to set up Swords Dance. It's going very well until the Hitmonlee hits me with a, a high jump kick and it does a lot of damage. The real clincher comes in when I set up my three dances on the second Onyx. I take some chip damage, then it goes for a rock throw and it nearly wipes me out. I survive with a mere 20 HP and the follow up Dig moves us on. Machamp comes in and Flamethrower just just misses knocking it out by a sliver. 
It does get burned, it wastes its turn on focus energy, and then burn takes us on to the next. I do hit level 69 in the fight, and that's nice. And if you don't know why that's nice, uh, just ask your mom, kid. Next up is Agatha, and you know how this fight goes if you have a ground move with enough speed. I do outspeed the first Gengar, and that bodes very well in this fight. A dig demolishes it, and next up is Golbat. And I showed this specific attempt because it's interesting that the AI decides to swap so much, it usually doesn't. The Golbat is the Pokemon that you would want to set up Swords Dance on, but I'm not even sure it's really needed. Maybe I should have went for some extra ones to actually outspeed the last Gengar, but I never really had to crunch numbers to really find out. Her Pokemon fold fairly easy, and the only potential threat is that if you hit some bad luck on the last Gengar, maybe it hits a long lasting hypnosis, but it would still take 2 or 3 Dream Eaters and some Nightshades to even take you out since we are at such a high level. And at this point you might be thinking, this looks really easy. Why did you level up so much? Well friends, we've already mentioned it early in the video. That's Gyarados, and I'm going to let the million times that Hydro Pump knock me out and talk a little bit about this fight and maybe a little bit of strategy before we get into the successful attempt. First, let's be positive. I enter this fight at level 71, and Charmander can actually tank a Hydro Pump. It's not a comfortable tank by any means. It will get you down anywhere from 20 to 30 HP. It's not impossible to make it past this horrendous hurdle, but the Aerodactyl without Sword Stance does outspeed you and it doesn't take much to finish you off. The very simple and very easy answer to this fight would have been just to take about 30 minutes of in-game time and level up a little bit or do like I did with Growlithe and constantly make it as far as I can in the Elite Four, take the loss, take the levels, and then just keep rinsing and repeating until I can get past it. Now this might be a little bit biased, but I want Charmander to have the absolute best time that it can. It wouldn't hurt too much in the race against Growlithe since I'm literally hours ahead of it at this point, but I'm in the business of proving that one random imager hater as wrong as humanly possible. This means a slight break in the spirit of the rules that I usually do in these runs, and by this I mean I don't save between members so that I can promote a consistent strategy that doesn't revolve around luck. And while I don't break this rule directly, the first three battles are so easy, I can make it to Lance virtually every time, so I am doing some, some pretty lucky stuff here, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm being stubborn about this fight because one of the things that makes this hobby really fun to me is figuring out how to get past hard fights without just leveling up past your problems. This scenario is basically like a puzzle and I was convinced with a little bit of luck, maybe throwing myself at the brick wall over and over, that I'd eventually figure out a strategy that could get us past this fight and I mess around with several ideas, but eventually I decide that a first turn sword stance is the way to go. It takes three body slams regularly to knock it out, but with one sword stance it takes it down to a two shot which is essentially the same amount of turns. More importantly is that sword stance raises my special by just a little bit via the badge boost which means I'll take a slight bit of less damage and allows us to survive that hydro pump at about 45 to 50 hit points. The strategy does take a bit of luck in about three different parts. The first one isn't that big of a deal, it's that the Gyarados cannot critically hit you. There's a very high chance of it not getting a crit, so it doesn't happen a whole lot. The second part is that you need Gyarados to miss one of its two Hydro Pups. You have two separate 20% chances of this happening, and this is perhaps the biggest RNG of the entire fight. The third is that you need Aerodactyl to go for a Supersonic and miss, or if it confuses you, you not to hit yourself in confusion. It can also miss its move just outright if it did like a Hyper Beam, it could just straight up miss, but that's way less likely. There's around a 25% chance for Supersonic to miss, so it's not awful, but straight up getting a Generation 1 miss on like a Hyper Beam is 1 out of 256, or slightly less than 0.4% if you want those kind of numbers. So all of these things have to add up to get past this fight, and I'm sure you've been watching all these failures in the background. This one took quite a while, but I was really determined to not level up. In reality, just being a few levels higher would have really made this fight infinitely easier, but I enjoy suffering for my 20 cents of YouTube ad revenue. So let's take a look at the single time out of the 573 attempts that it took to get past this fight. Starting out with the Gyarados, it actually misses its first turn Hydro Pump, so I go for a second Sword Stance. Now with this rare occurrence, it actually makes Body Slam a one shot. And this has never happened to me. It's really a shame that it took this long for me to see this scenario. 
but it wasn't very common, but that's just how I did it on the fly. We are decently healthy on the first Dragonair. I decide to set up the last Swords Dance to be as strong as I possibly can, and I let whatever move come through. If it's a Hyper Beam, so be it. It does go for a slam. It doesn't do a ton of damage, and the follow-up turn allows us to just one-shot it. Charmander can also one-hit the next Dragonair when it comes in as well. Things are going fairly well. Next up is the Aerodactyl, and we have to roll the dice on this part. We outspeed it, but at level 71, Body Slam does not not one shot it. It's fairly close, it triggers a retroactive hyper potion and another body slam comes teasingly close to knocking it out. Now here comes the lucky part, it goes for supersonic, it misses and that's exactly the sequence of events that we need to solve this dickhead puzzle. I take it out and now it's time for Dragon Eye. And not to be too anticlimactic but Body Slam can just one shot it with a three swords dance boost and it gets us past. And it's that easy guys. What an easy fight that didn't take me hours to do. Last up is the rival fight and without a doubt I would have just leveled up for Lance if this fight gave me any trouble at all. But to go ahead and spoil it for you guys, this one is a one and done fight and thank god for that. I needed this run to be over, long elite 4 runs are pretty grating. Now on to the champion fight commentary. The Pidgeot isn't a threat and I decide to set up the full suite of my Swords Dance goodness on it. I take the slightest amount of damage from some wing attacks and at the end of my third Sword Dance it charges up a Sky Attack but a Body Slam takes it out before any more damage is done. Next up is Alakazam and we are very boosted and Dig demolishes it. Dig also takes out the Rhydon with relative ease and not even the legendary beefiness of Arcanine could withstand a triple Sword Dance boosted dig. And next up we have a huge shocker as Executor actually can survive a flamethrower. It pathetically hits us with some barrage damage and then we take it out on the next turn. And now to finish off this severely disappointing final battle, a non-critical hit body slam takes out the blast toys in a single hit. And that's the run. It's over. Perhaps uh, any other circumstance I would have just gotten a couple of extra levels and that would do something like make the Aerodactyl be a one shot and my real life time would have been much faster. But it's over and before I get into some thoughts, uh, let's answer the question of how did Charmander actually do? Well the real answer here is much better than Growlithe to absolutely no one's surprise outside of people on the internet that have nothing better to do with their lives other than argue about things that they don't actually know. Go figure. People like that actually exist. Charmander finishes the run with a solid time of 4 hours and 53 minutes with a level of 72. It's not the best run, but it's fairly close to runs like Bellsprout that did the run with minimum battles mainly due to, I guess, Bellsprout using raps and all that kind of stuff. Hypnosis and rap. You remember that run. The most important thing is that this run was well over 2 hours faster than Growlithe and even if I did have to grind a little bit extra to make the Gyarados more consistent it still would have been a blowout. If anything this really shows how much of a menace Gyarados can be if you don't have a great answer to it. That one single Pokemon was the single reason I needed all these extra levels and without it in the equation I think I could have saved well over an hour maybe an hour and a half and been the second ranked pre-evolved Pokemon behind Ghastly. In a lot of these runs you'll notice a common theme. It's always Gyarados or Alakazam. If you have a Pokemon that can deal with both of these, runs are generally very easy and that's kind of a common thread with all of those top tier Pokemon from the list that includes the evolved Pokemon. There are two more pre-evolved fire types in Gen 1 and while I do think Vulpix is a very interesting pick, the lack of badge boosting means I think Charmander would still retain its fire type crown and not be able to be dethroned. And that's really all I have to say. It was fun getting back into these pre-evolve runs as they are much more challenging coming off of about a month or more of sub 3 hour stops. I'm surprised Charmander actually made a sub 5 hour time with all the extra grinding, but I'll take it. And as usual, if you made it this far in the video, I really appreciate you guys, and any comments, likes, interactions really help spread the channel around to new viewers, and it's people like you that really make me come back to the hobby again and again. So thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next week, and since you've made it this far, I'll go ahead and spoil the Pokemon for you. It's going to be Rhyhorn. The 25 speed, times 4 weak to water and grass, only learns normal moves, and doesn't learn a new move naturally until level 30. That should be a fucking blast. That's it. Bye.